it in your studies thus far. I look at the fact that Revelation says that she is the mother of harlots and of all abominations of the earth. So my question is, is what about the Hindu religion? What about the Buddhist religion? Is she actually the mother of these religions as well? Well, <clears throat> what's interesting is if you go back to the Tower of Babel and the spirit of idol worship and the mother-daughter cult. It's referred to there in the story of Samarius. Right. And the, um, the spirit of Antichrist in all these religions okay. uh, has manifested as far back as the Tower of Babel at least. And so we're seeing, we'll see that that'll play out. Now, Specifically with Islam and Christianity, over 50% of the world's population is involved in, in one of those two belief systems. I'm, I'm using that term from a secular standpoint. You know, Brother Gary, that brings out a very interesting point, though, and I never thought about it like this before. We know that in Revelation she's called Mystery Babylon, the mother of great, that's in Revelation 17. And <clears throat> it, it makes sense more now because that's where, and actually I just happen to have it open here, I wasn't thinking about this, but it says upon her forehead was written and was, was a name written Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now you go back to the Tower of Babel and I never thought about it like that. But the Tower of Babel is where it's basically the mother that has started everything. Right. And that is where all the different religions come from. The only reason it's called Mystery Babylon here is because the, now the original Babylonian uh, beginnings there in paganism is now become That's a, it. a mock. Uh, uh, it's the same thing as what was happening back at the Tower of Babel. But right. The only thing is now they've tried to include Christ mm -hmm. in their particular religion. It's the same religion all the way down. I never thought about it like that. And I, I, I saw an interesting or heard an interesting study. There's a lot of parallels, and to my Catholic brothers and sisters um, that maybe haven't heard this before, I'm saying it from a point of, uh, of conversation and, and study. Many of the customs that have been adopted in the Catholic Church relate back to the uh, the mother-child relationship, uh, and that's that's another topic that we can get into. But we see a lot of those customs carried forward into some of the the Queen of Heaven, for example. Right. Those terms, in all reverence to you know Mary, the you know the earthly mother of our of our Savior uh, in the flesh. Um, the the worship or or deifying of uh, the disciples, for example, worshiping them other than as men. Um, we know that that is uh, some would interpret that as idol, idol worship. So there are there are several more than several things on that on that particular issue alone. Um, but that was a great question, Steve. That was a very good question. It's interesting, you know, to, and, and you know, as you, as you mentioned as well, when we look at the, the different people that are, that are in the Catholic faith, it's really no different than even some of the other religions out there, Brother Gary. Uh, I know the more specific, Alberto Rivera used to refer and say, you know, there's a lot of good Catholic people that, that, that love the Lord, they just have no idea that the system they're in That's exactly is, not, right. is not getting them to Christ. And he said they, they need to be evangelized. That was his exact words. They need to be evangelized and be one to Christ. Because yeah. when he came out, he recognized he did not know Yeshua. He did not know the Jesus that, that he needed to know. And, and so there was a tremendous void. It's almost like Judaism. And Judaism, you know, we don't know as Jews. We never knew. I mean, although we, we knew Yeshua as far, okay, his name is Yeshua. He's Jesus. He's, uh, he is the... Messiah to the Gentiles, uh, we understand that, but we've got Moses. That, that's our way of thinking of it. We have Moses, we believe Moses, and we believe the prophets. 
Um, and that's all we need. But when we recognize... Yeah, but there's, there's one important distinction with Israel. And that, first off, the, the Christian heritage, as we know, is Jewish. Israel was doing things looking toward the coming of Messiah. And for those uh, Jews that are still doing that, that haven't seen Jesus for who he is, but are expecting the imminent coming of Messiah, we know that they'll see him whom they've pierced, but the things that they're doing are in faith based on the word of God, and they're justified by their faith. Right. And uh, so Israel and the Jewish people... Um, are unique in that. Um, and God, we know God has a special covenant with Israel. And, and uh, that, that because they, as a nation, saw dimly, yes. the word of God then went forth to all nations throughout the world. But one day the scales will fall completely off all of Israel's eyes. But right. those that have been doing things in faith, looking for the coming of Messiah, even though they haven't seen him yet, they're, they're doing those things in faith, and they're justified by their faith. Right. And, you know, it's a good point you bring up too, Brother Jerry, because I've just, I've got a message the other day, and, and many people that listen, they, they, they've heard me say this over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that the Jewish people, that from the time of Christ when he came and he died, that they, all these Jews here now have lost and gone to hell because they didn't believe that Yeshua was Mashiach. Uh, as and you know full well, I've quoted this before, when they said, "Let His blood be upon us and upon our children." Right. God took and applied that His own blood to their lives, right. so that they would not be lost. Exactly. And I like that the way you put it there too, like with Abraham. In fact, it's a beautiful analogy, brother Gary, because Abraham believed in a promise afar off and, and endured to see that promise fulfilled. Right. And it took many, many years for that fulfillment to come to pass. Uh, and in, in reality, the very promise of that he was looking for was not even Isaac. This is what's the, iron, uh, yeah. the, the irony of it all. It wasn't even Isaac. It was Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, mm -hmm. was that promise son he right. really was looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, um, we know this from some of the visions because that he has. I mean, he sees that Israel, that his own descendants will be in bondage for 400 years uh, in, a, in, a, in a strange land. And Moses writes they were there for 430 years. Paul confers that, uh, confirms that and says the same. Uh, but that is a beautiful analogy that I've never thought about before, that, that they, they were justified by their faith knowing that God was going to send them Praise God. I like that. And God said... Abraham, don't sacrifice your son. I've seen your faith. I'll sacrifice mine 2,000 years from now. Yes. Praise God. Uh, going forward, uh, 1962 was a very important year. Pope John the Twenty-Third, of course, now in defining ecumenicalism in trying to promote unity among the various denominations and churches and other religions, convenes the Vatican Council. Matter, matter of fact, it was called Vatican II. And as we pointed out, the, fa the fatal flaw in ecumenicalism is that it's based on compromise and not on biblical truth. In that Vatican II, this is very important. It's very prophetic. I think you'll pick right up on it. The Catholic Church called for, quote, all of her departed daughters to come home. Wow. Now, what that's saying is the Catholic Church was beginning to lay, try and lay aside any of the barriers to the Christian denominations. And the Catholic Church referred to the Protestant denominations as her daughters. How do we know this? Because we skip ahead a few years to when a Cardinal Ratzinger, who was in charge of the doctrine for the Catholic Church, and he would later become Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, he defined what the daughters were. And he said that the Catholic Church was to be considered the mother, and the daughters were the 
various Christian denominations that be, through, the, through the Reformation had separated from Catholicism and now they were being welcomed back. Brother Gary, now... I'm going to read you that quote when I get to it. It's, I know I get to steal your notes before you leave, but I, keep help, I can't help but writing them. I'm sitting here writing notes. I, I'm glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what, what gets me? Pope Benedict, when he was, before he was Pope, he was Rad Singer at the time, he defines what the daughters are. Yeah. And they know this is written in the book of Revelation. How can they be so foolish in defining themselves right into the Word of God, whether they do it directly or indirectly? It's kind of like when, when, when Tony Palmer, Bishop Tony Palmer, who's an Anglican bishop, Pope uh, Francis has him, he, they were friends in, in Argentina, so he has him come to the Vatican, and they say this wasn't planned. This was definitely planned. The whole purpose for them making a video with his phone was to make it look more intimate. And I actually have, and I have, I guess I'm going to have to play this in this, in this video here for the people as well. Uh, because there was a brother in Germany, he sent me a message, uh, because right after I first published the article, uh, where Tony is talking about how that, he's saying to Pope Francis, he said, look, he says, Kenneth Copeland, he's having this big convention with all the evangelical leaders from around the country. They're going to be there. And he says, these are big fish. This is what he calls them, big fish, Pope Francis. He said, these guys have got 10,000, 20,000 uh, in congregations like this. These guys, they fly jet planes and stuff. Well, when I first exposed that, right after I exposed that, Brother Gary, these guys, like, they must have a hotline to our channel or something, buddy. They went on their <laughs> channel and they removed that part of the video. They cut that part of the video out so the world couldn't see it. Well, I had a brother in Germany, though. He was kind enough. He had screen captured the whole interview. And he said, Brother Steve, don't worry. Uh, I know you said you was going to show it. I know they cut it out because you put that article out. But uh, he said, I saved the whole thing for you. I'll send it to you in an email so you can have it. So i, I got to post that in here. But that's, that's wonderful to have favor, isn't it? Yeah, that, this <laughs> is what he says as well. And then we're having... But here's what I was going to bring out about Tony Palmer, though, that was kind of ironic about him, was Tony says, in, in doing this interview here, he said, uh, I come to you in the spirit of Elijah. And he said, to turn the heart of the children to the fathers. And he's defining the popes, or the, or not just the popes, but the, all of the, uh, the, the Catholic priests as fathers. Mm -hmm. And he says it's time for you to come home. Yeah, yeah, they'll they'll try and define it as the. Well, I'm going to read you the words here from Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI. To define Protestant churches referred to in Vatican II as daughters. Quote. He's writing this years later. It must always be clear when the expression sister churches is used in this proper sense that the one holy Catholic and apostolic, apostolic universal church is not sister but mother of all the particular churches. Now that is really very key. Because we know in Revelation, when Revelation references the mother of all harlots. So now that would suppose that if there's a mother of all harlots, there must be daughter harlots. You couldn't have hit the nail on the head better with that right there. And you know the sad thing is, Brother Gary, the way you can define who the harlots are are those denominations that go home. Right. You can't make it any clearer than that. So we already know the Presbyterians have gone home. Uh, the Episcopalians have gone home. Now what really concerns me is, and I've already published this before on the air, we have, and hopefully I'll put this in here if I can remember this, I'll, I'll make a note of this as well. Uh, the video, I have a video, and this was with, with Pope Benedict and with Pope Francis as well. I believe with Pope Benedict, they, they have the heads of the different churches of the United States. 
the Baptist church head was there, the at the unit, or excuse me, the evangelical head was there, etc. They go on and on and on. It's all these major heads of churches. And then when Pope Francis was inaugurated, he brought the heads of the churches of the European Union. And again, the leading denominations of the world came there and they bow before him. And I've been told that when you come before the Pope, they don't just bow publicly like that. They go in private and they're to bow and they're to kiss his ring. Um, the other thing that, 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 that also that you'll find is very interesting. Every person that goes before the Pope will always be dressed in black. Very interesting. And thus far, when I was told this, I've gone back yeah. and I've looked at picture after picture after picture after picture, and they're all wearing black. And I've got specific um, examples and dates of exactly what you're talking about. The, uh, for example, the Southern Baptist National Convention um, aligning with the Vatican. Well, it's one thing to have a mutual uh, agreement of friendship. Again, we're not, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is compromising your, your biblical doctrines and truth at the expense of a, a compromise just to quote-unquote be seen as being um, ecumenical and, and uh, inclusive as defined by this new term interfaithism. Uh, <clears throat> The other interesting thing about Vatican II in 1962, just as an aside, 1962 was the year that the Supreme Court voted to take prayer out of our schools. Whoa. Uh, that's another discussion. Okay, so we move along then to 1963. Again, Pope John XXIII on July 2nd, 63, published his encyclical decree Pesa Menteris, or Peace on Earth. Again, these terms, uh, on the surface, who would not want peace on Earth? Right. It called for world government with world power. The Pope favored more social justice. And we'll talk about social justice. The Pope issued a plea to the UN to become more equal to the magnitude and mobility of its task. And the Pope's encyclical um, my reference was reported in Look Magazine, made a case for the establishment of world government with all the cogency of his theologian best proofs that God exists. So in Vatican language, he's calling for a world government, a public authority is how they term it, but it's a world government, and defines it as having worldwide power and endowed with the proper means for the efficacious pursuit of the universal common good. So he wants this centralized UN government to have all the power that it's going to need to pursue what it deems is pursuing the universal common good. And that's another definition. The Pope held that such a government must be founded because all nations are now independent. Now, two years later, in 1965, the, the Bishop of Verdun, France, Pierre Bouillon, continues to renounce national sovereignty in his book entitled The Council and the Future, and it's a clarion call for one world government. In his book, he says, quote, Therefore, we must emphasize the great moral responsibility to empower an international authority to prevent war the entire world must become aware that if this institution is to become effective, every nation must renounce its ultimate sovereignty to this universal authority. This is an obligation, quote, unquote. He goes on to say that, quote, if nations, if rulers of nations, if public opinion will not accept this renunciation, then they really are voting for war however beautiful may be their speeches on peace. Now this is a clear call uh, for renouncing the sovereignty of a nation in favor of a one world government. In 1967, Pope Paul VI, on March 26th of 67, in his encyclical, 
was it was called Populorum Progressio. In it, the Pope said, Who can fail to see the need and importance of thus gradually coming to the establishment of a world authority capable of taking effective action on the juridical and political planes? Delegates to international organizations, public officials, gentlemen of the press, teachers, and educators, all of you must realize that you have your part to play in the construction of a new world order. That's interesting because now we're beginning to see that term being used. And I'm going to pause for just That's a second. In That's in 1967. So, so they try to put, there's so many people try to put this over on, uh, on President Bush, senior that is, that he's the one that was kind of like coining the word for the New World Order, but it's all the way back to 1967. Right, it is. And, and before that, they're calling for one world government. Now, Pope Paul, Pope Paul VI that actually... Yes, and I hope everyone's seeing that Every pope that comes into office, and there's going to be one here in a minute that's only in office for 33 days, we really don't know. Uh, pope John Paul I, who tried to quell corruption in the Vatican, and after 33 days, dies mysteriously. And, and there are those that go on record as saying he was assassinated for trying to do so. Not my words, their words from multiple sources. But we're seeing that every pope that is coming into office is issuing these encyclicals on one world government in favor of redistribution of wealth and uh, in concert with a, a communist socialistic form of government. Well, you know, now, Brother Gary, it seems like that they are radically um, bringing about this particular event. And uh, uh, what's, what's interesting is that it seems like the rest of the world would go along with this to some degree already. Uh, I can't say that Vladimir Putin is really on it himself, because you can kind of tell when you see him go before Pope, uh, Pope uh, Francis there, a lot of animosity in the background there. But, uh, but when it comes to the rest of the world, the United States, the EU, uh, you could automatically, South America and, and the Central America, they're all for the Pope no matter what. They're, they're just automatically on his side. It's interesting you bring that up, Steve, because we're going to get to an example here in a minute with Gorbachev. And you had asked, you'd made the point, that seems uncharacteristic that Gorbachev would align with the Vatican. But what you're seeing now with Putin is someone who wants to restore the former Soviet Union yes, yes. with an iron fist that is not falling into line with this. I was told that Gorbachev was actually put into place, or was they moved him into power, that it was a jet, that and very much could have been a Jesuit himself, but there was a bishop behind him getting into power in, in Russia. And this is why we see the, relax, the, the relaxation of the government, why he, where he went to a democracy for the short period of time. Um, and like Israel, Israel is very much like Russia. Uh, they, we have the Jesuits that were involved there. We have uh, Shimon Perez, which I call the son of Ahab, and him marrying Jezebel, bringing idolatry back into Israel. But uh, Barry Chalmers clearly puts his finger not directly on the trigger, but he is the uh, Shimon Perez was behind the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, and ironically, when Ariel Sharon is having tea with Shimon Perez, why is it that suddenly Shimon Perez walks out of the room and Ariel Sharon falls over into into, into a, with a massive stroke? Uh, you know, every everyone that this man was around that doesn't go along with the ideology of what the Vatican was trying to push either died or ended up something severely bad happened to them. And this is what they're trying to force on the Russians as well. Interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, when we get to Gorbachev, Gorbachev cooperates. Uh, it's a it's an experiment. It's, it's an experiment that appears to be watched cautiously regarding allowing Poland to expand. They were initially shut down when Lekwalica started his movement. The Vatican was from the start uh, in cooperation with that, but initially that movement was shut down, but it was relaxed under Gorbachev, and it appears to be a cautious social experiment to see if 
The Vatican could deliver on its promise to show communism how it could work with the assistance and the affiliation of the church. And when that did work, and it, it spread to other nations, they called it the Velvet Revolution, other Eastern Bloc nations. And as you said, uh, they were willing to relax a little bit of, in compared to what the people had, still maintaining control, uh, but, but, but relax to see how this experiment would work. And, and now we see with Putin, um, yeah, they've still got that, but he's, there's more controls in place even uh, under the surface than they had. Exactly. Uh, with Putin Gorbachev. Still part of it. I, there was a friend of mine that's from uh, uh, fr from the uh, the Ukraine, and uh, as he put it to me, when the, the tensions were rising and, and Barack Obama is threatening Putin, and he says, "Steve, if you think about it, he spends 45 minutes on the phone with Barack Obama. Do you think they were on there fussing and fighting?" He says, "No. They already have decided who gets what, and he said this is just." Uh, it's just politics, right? And he said this this whole game is already set up. You know, there, there's millions and billions of dollars at stake on who gets what in there, and so it's really just a fight over who's going to get this or who's going to get that. And the Vatican wants the Ukraine as part of the European Union, and Putin didn't want that uh, because uh, for him it's a strategic place for the, for the sovereignty of his own nation. And yet, uh, the Catholic Church didn't want to lose the money that they had already invested there because of the natural gas and all that was there as well. So they were trying to bring them into the EU.